Father, to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <clears throat> And Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to worship you and also to glorify you, now through the study of your word especially. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you provided for us and our families, and we ask that you continue to watch over each and every one of us and provide for our every need so that we may continue to walk in your will and plan, glorifying you. And Father, we thank you for uh, this time that we have together this evening, and we ask that you lead us now in the concentration and focus on the word that you have for us as we study your great book of Leviticus. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so if you like, uh, let's go to chapter 7 of uh, our textbooks on page uh, 117 in uh, my book. But uh, in uh, chapter 7, <clears throat> and uh, here we have the uh, outline and uh, the heading of what we're going to note in this chapter. And uh, as the heading goes, again, this is the book of Leviticus. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, third book of the Bible, third book of the Pentateuch. And this is all about instructions for holy living, as they have for their title. And on the first page, just to give you some outline, uh, it's, uh, it, it begins by, we're going to have a little bit of background in regard to the book of Leviticus. Then we'll talk about its contents, the, uh, the outline of it, the overview of this book. And then the three major themes uh, will be discussed as well, which one is the law, Two is sacrifices and the importance of them, and then also holiness, as we uh, will see uh, from uh, the meanings of all the sacrifices and what the law brought to the people of Israel. Then the objectives, after reading this chapter, we should be able to, one, compare the usage, uh, use of sacrifice in Israel compared to the sacrifices in the Mesopotamia culture, and we've been talking about uh, the Mesopotamian culture uh, throughout the other books as well, in contrast to what the Bible and the, the, the people of Israel were all about. Then we should also contrast the emphasis on worship in Leviticus with that of Exodus and see the differences there. Outline the basic content of the book of Leviticus, definitely could be, should be able to do that. List the types of the Old Testament sacrifices and explain their usage. Hopefully you can already do that because I've taught on that very recently. Uh, and then also the, uh, we'll uh, understand, identify the three basic themes of the book and then describe how modern Christians relate to the Old Testament law. All right, so uh, before I get into the uh, textbook and uh, get into the detail uh, outlined for us there, I did want to share some other information uh, with you uh, from my own studies and my own preparation in regard to uh, helping us to understand what this book is all about. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, what we understand is that the author of this book, as you know, is Moses. He wrote the first five books of the Pentateuch uh, soon after uh, uh, having uh, released from their captivity in Egypt and then uh, going out to Mount Sinai. Ultimately, God gave Moses the law and uh, gave him the instructions uh, and the information necessary to write those first five books of the Bible. And this was written anywhere from 1450 to uh, 410 B.C., in which he wrote this. And again, we can't be exact on the dates, but we have a good estimate as to when they were. This is an outline that I grabbed from Ryrie's uh, study Bible. And here you can uh, see the uh, time frame in which this was written and the history that was around it. But again, kind of in the middle there where it says God gives the Ten Commandments to Israel, that was around 1445, again 1450 to 410, around that time period. But it was after the exodus from Egypt, and it was also uh, well after they were brought into uh, the, the, uh, the place of Egypt where Joseph and uh, his family came down. Jacob brought his family down into Egypt. And then they found shelter through Joseph, who was a ruler of Egypt at that time. And then 480 years later, now they're enslaved and under bondage. And as you know, the rest of the story that we noted in the book of Exodus, Moses comes along by the hand of God and brings these people out of captivity and brings them ultimately into the wilderness, leading them to the promised land. And then later on, you can see them entering into the promised land. And then uh, we see the rule of the judges of over Israel before they had their first king. So again, a brief uh, outline as to where this uh, stands in position with the other historical events of the Bible. 
When we talk about the contents of the book of Leviticus, there are 27 chapters that we have before us. And uh, this comes, the name of this comes from the Levitical priesthood. We're going to read about that a little bit uh, this evening. But remember, uh, Aaron, who was the brother of Moses, again, his family, which were called the Levites, because they were from the tribe of Levi, ultimately that's where we get the name Leviticus. And uh, we're going to see uh, in our book that it was really the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament Testament that gave the name Leviticus to the book of Leviticus. So the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which happened much, much later after its writing, ultimately that's uh, where the name Leviticus came from and the origins of it. The Hebrews called this book the called one because that's the first word that you have in this book. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But ultimately, this is establishing uh, things for Israel. Again, uh, giving them the law, giving them the sacrifices. And it all has to do with the Levitical priesthood and their responsibilities over the tabernacle and, in, and leading the people of Israel in the worship of God. So, as you remember, Exodus concluded with the creation of the tabernacle after Moses had received uh, the instructions for creating and building the tabernacle. Then we saw uh, God raising up craftsmen and uh, specific individuals who had skill to be able to form and fashion the tabernacle, and they put that together. So, again, Exodus concludes with that. Now we begin in the book of Leviticus, and it's kind of like a pause from the history line because we started with Genesis in creation, and we saw the history coming down all the way through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and then we see Moses and the Exodus, but now we have a pause before we get back into the history of Israel, and they're wandering through the wilderness and then entering into the promised land, which we will get back into in the next book, which is the book of Numbers. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then we'll see a little bit more of that in Deuteronomy as well. But here we have a pause, and this pause is important and specific because it gives them the law or other aspects of the law in the service and worship inside and outside of the tabernacle. So this answers the question, how was the tabernacle used? Ultimately, they were given instructions in the book of Leviticus as to what to do with this thing called the tabernacle, about the sacrifices and all the rituals that would go along with that as well. And uh, again, in Exodus chapter 40, uh, verse 14, we see Moses receiving the instructions. And then in Numbers chapter 10, verse 11, that's where we pick it up again. Now, when we see the history of Israel continuing. So this book of Leviticus was given between that, the instructions of the tabernacle, and where we pick up the history of Israel in Numbers chapter 10, verse 11. So... <clears throat> The book is a manual for the priesthood, and that's really what this is. So the priests know how to officiate over the sacrifices, how to operate within the temple. Again, they had all the different articles. Uh, they had the brazen altar, the brazen laver, the holy place, the holy of holies. This gives them instruction as to how to function and operate within them. And again, the ones that were to function and operate and officiate were from the tribe of Levi. But we also see in this book a number of laws for the people and how Israel was to govern the people as well. So we see the laws for the people and how to function and operate in a holy way. But then we also see the governance or the civil laws that we also understand how Israel operated as a people within their society and how neighbor was to treat neighbor. So we see all of that in this book of Leviticus. So the book is, uh, can be viewed in three complementary ways as we look at this book. First and foremost, we understand that it's a book about the holiness of God. You see, everything in the law talks about how holy God is and how God has given us the law so we can emulate that holiness. So that's what this book is all about, to emulate the holiness of God. And it tells us of the holiness of God and His requirements for our fellowship with Him. And I shouldn't say our fellowship, but the Israelites' fellowship with Him because, again, they were under the law in the church age. We're no longer under the law. So again, it was all about their fellowship with God to bring them into a holy place and a holy relationship with Him. Secondly, the book reveals the sinful nature of man. 
And this really is brought out for us when we get into the Old, excuse me, get into the New Testament and now look back at what the law was all about. The law was all about sin and representing sin to mankind so that man would know what their sin was and what sin was not. So they could understand how to operate in righteousness and what it meant to operate in unrighteousness or unholiness. So it revealed to them that man was sinful. And really in those first five sacrifices that we see in the first seven chapters, remember two of them were directly related to sin, the sin offering and the trespass offering. So again, it recognized how man is sinful. And then thirdly, it also uh, reveals the God's plan of atonement for sinful man. And again, the, all these sacrifices were all about teaching them about the payment of the penalty for their sins, that ultimately God would uh, complete for them when Jesus Christ would come and go to the cross. When Emmanuel would come, when the Messiah would come, ultimately he would bring them atonement. So we see uh, that it's all about atonement and the provisions of access to God for sinful man through the atoning sacrifices that represented what God would do for them. So... The language of sacrifice, when you go through this book, the language of sacrifice is all over it, and it really is one of the dominant themes within this, all pointing, as you know, to the person and the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the word sacrifice itself is used 42 times within this book, so again, uh, very much a predominant theme, but we also see other predominant themes where we see priest used 189 times within this book. And as you know, the Levitical priesthood did two things. One, it represented Jesus Christ, who is the high priest and the great high priest, the royal high priest. And then it also talks about the church age believer, that we now are royal high priests as well. So it gives us example of the priesthood that was for the Israelites as they officiated over the tabernacle, but it also gives us good example or typology of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the, and the priesthood that we have now in the church age. Blood is another predominant theme, as you can think of, with sacrifice always comes blood, as you know, or not always, but whenever it's an animal sacrifice comes blood. But ultimately that's used 86 times. The word holy is used 87 times. So this is what it's all about, the sacrifices, the priesthood, officiating over the sacrifices, the blood being shed of our Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, that would bring about what? Holiness to mankind. And as Jesus was perfectly holy, he would bring that perfect holiness to us as well. So then we see that, and then as I said, atonement uh, is another important word, and that is used 45 times. And interestingly enough, the New Testament refers to the book of Leviticus 90 times. And what's the number 90 mean? Judgment times what? Perfect order, divine order. So perfect divine order is what's in view. So... That's what the New Testament reflects back on the law that is given to us in Leviticus. All right, so uh, uh, I've got uh, some more things I'll show you as we go through the book and the outline uh, of the book of Leviticus in our textbook tonight. And I'll show you some more pictures as well. But let's get into the textbook now and uh, see and understand the outline of our book. All right, so it begins by saying Leviticus is one of the most neglected books of the Bible. This is true for two main reasons. First, the book seems quite strange to modern readers. Again, we don't do sacrifices today as they did in the past. As they say, sacrificial worship, is uh, it describes, is so far removed from today's believers that is ve- it, its very unfamiliarity prevents some from uh, reading Leviticus. Second, Leviticus appears at first glance to be or or to interrupt the flow of events in the story of God's people. And we must wait until the fourth book of the Pentateuch, the book of Numbers, to read of Israel's journey from Mount Sinai to the edge of the promised land. Yet Leviticus plays an essential role in God's Word and makes a vital contribution to our understanding of God's relationship with humankind. We need to make an extra effort required to understand its message, and we must all attempt to understand the ancient practice of sacrifice and its significance for Old Testament religion. And again, that we've talked about it uh, most recently in, uh, in regard to our study of the book of Ephesians because it uh, lent very nicely to the sacrifices and us understanding what they were. 
But whether you studied that with us or not, again, it's very important that you always go in and go back to these laws and go back to the sacrifices and recognize the typology and the significance of the typology that they bring out. It will open up your eyes even more to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And as we uh, talked about those five Levitical offerings uh, in the past couple of weeks, uh, remember, as I said to you then, I'll say it to you now, it's interesting how it took five different types of sacrifices with all their different rituals and rules to talk about the one picture of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Again, one sacrifice in itself doesn't cover it all because what Jesus Christ did covered all. And again, he completed so much and so much went into that one efficacious work that he accomplished on the cross that again, God needed not only the five Levitical offerings, but the entire law to explain what Jesus Christ accomplished for us and for all of mankind upon the cross. All right, so back in the book, let Leviticus uh, play an essential role in God's Word and make a vital contribution to our understanding of God's relationship uh, with uh, mankind. We need to make the extra effort required to understand its message. We must all attempt to understand the ancient practice of sacrifice and it's significant for Old Testament religion. I read that already, didn't I? All right, let's go on. In a sense, Leviticus does interpret the narrative of the Pentateuch. The storyline flows naturally from the conclusion of Exodus to Numbers chapter 10. Leviticus and Numbers 1 through 10 form an intermission of legal material, but this observation illustrates the importance of the book. The Israelites would not have inserted Leviticus into their sacred literature if it were not important to their history. And here's an important point. It, its emphasis on personal, priestly, and national holiness was a necessary and integral part of that story. So again, personal, priestly, and national blessings and holiness all come from the Levitical uh, the book of Leviticus and understanding its meaning. So then it goes on to say, despite its strangeness and apparent awkwardness, Leviticus plays an important role in the thought flow of the Pentateuch. It was of great significance for an, in, uh, for an ancient Israelite or for ancient Israelites and is still pertinent for modern Christians. So even for us today, not that we keep the law, nor that we're under the law, but ultimately it tells us volumes about what the spiritual life is for the church age and what, it, what Christ uh, did for us upon the cross. All right, so then background. Background to the book of Leviticus. All of Israel's neighbors among the ancient Near Eastern nations practiced sacrificial worship. Animal sacrifice was common in ancient Mesopotamia and similar to that of Israel. Israel even shared many of the same terms for the different types of sacrifices with her more immediate neighbors in Canaan. The sacrifices of the ancient Near East, like those of Israel, were designed to provide fellowship with the deity, to appease the gods, and to ensure continuous of divine favor. So again, just to give you a pause and speak on that a little bit more, remember, they were, you know, God had commanded sacrifices all the way from coming out of the Garden of Eden. Cain and Abel were committing sacrifices unto God. Abel was doing his right according to God's word, or we could even say God's law, little l law, as God commanded him to, but Cain was not. He was doing something on his own. He was going off in his own direction. And he was taking from the fruits of the ground that he had, uh, he had uh, uh, raised himself, and he was offering his own works up to the Lord. And the Lord did not accept his works because, again, they were human works rather than divine good as commanded by God. So we see that all the way back from Cain and Abel as they came out of the Garden of Eden and all the way down through Moses and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way down. And now we see Moses receiving the law and it really expands on what the sacrifices were to be. But again, backing up, if Cain and Abel were committing sacrifices and Noah committing sacrifices, again, that would be passed down from generation to generation uh, in the people that came from Noah and his family. And so some of them were doing it in a right way. Some of these nations, as you know, at the Tower of Babel, God split up the world into nations with different languages. And some of them were doing it in the right way. 
But at the same time, you know, the Tower of Babel was a corrupt thing. And ultimately, that's why God uh, uh, created the various languages and broke the people up because it was too easy for Satan to corrupt them all in one fell swoop. So again, he broke up that, uh, into na uh, nationalities, and they went off in their different directions. But even with that, some, as I said, would do it right, because they kept to the faith of the one and true God. But then Satan would influence the others and give them false information and counterfeit what God's sacrifices were all about. So again, we see it all throughout the world and all throughout ancient history. Sacrifices were committed everywhere. And especially when you read anything about any of the false gods of the uh, pagan world, ultimately there were sacrifices involved. And they all were counterfeits of, uh, from Satan of God's truth as found in the scriptures or as uh, now as uh, before the, the Pentateuch was given to us, as was passed down through the oral uh, law that God had given to the people. And again, no different than today that Satan counterfeits the things of God and the Word of God in all these religions and denominations that we have. Many of them are counterfeited now as to having false religion and false worship within them because they're not following the Word of God. They've gone off and doing their own thing and doing their own human good works. So again, many of the things that the Israelites were commanded to do were already going on in other ancient lands. But again, some of them in truth passed down from Noah in those generations, but others uh, from Satan counterfeiting them and corrupting them. All right, getting back into the book. But certain differences existed between the Israelite sacrificial system and those of the ancient Near East. And here's the difference. Superficial differences are obvious, such as a lack of burning sacrifices by fire in Mesopotamia, as the Israelites did. They just kill the animal, then discard it. However, there are more fundamental differences that, uh, that made Israel unique. First and foremost is that Mesopotamians commonly used the sacrificial animal as a means of clairvoyance in order to discern the future actions of the gods. Priestly specialists believed they could decipher the future by studying and reading a dead animal's entrails. Such practices were absent in Israel. So again, when God had them commit the sacrifices, He wasn't saying, okay, now go through all the goop and the guck and the junk, and then, oh, what is that telling you? No. God had meaning to the sacrifice, and He said, this is the meaning that I have for it. Just commit the sacrifice. Don't be looking for anything else. I'll tell you all you need to know. But again, just like today with tarot card reading and palm reading and fortune telling and you know, uh, a crystal ball reading and speaking to the dead, again, all those are counterfeit uh, fits to the true spiritual life. And again, that was going on in the ancient world as well as they would read the entrails of the sacrificial animals. All right, second, the most distinctive aspect of the Israelite sacrificial system is the way it was linked to the covenantal relationship with God. God gave the instructions for Israel's sacrifices during the last month and a half of the people, or when the people were at Mount Sinai, between the construction of the tabernacle in 4017, which I showed you already, and the departure from the mountain in Numbers chapter 10, verse 11. The sacrifices make up a major ingredient of the covenant bond between Israel and God. The ancient Near Eastern nations have nothing comparable to that whatsoever. So again, these were all about bringing them near to God. Again, the other ones were all them trying to figure out, you know, what's going on? What's our future about? And again, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more along the lines of appeasing gods and rather than entering into a covenant relationship with them. All right, then uh, number three <clears throat> is that the unique feature of Israel's use of the sacrifices is her concept of holiness. Israel's notion of the term holy which is the Hebrew word kadas, was based on the elevated moral and ethical nature of God. Because this idea was so central to the covenant with Yahweh, as it says in Exodus 19.6, it also impacted Israel's use of the sacrificial system for worship of Yahweh. Israel's neighbors had no such 
concept. So again, you know, it wasn't about coming to the holiness of, of their God or even becoming holy themselves. Ultimately, theirs was more about appeasing and, you know, uh, you know, satisfying pleasure than it was about coming to a righteousness and a holiness through the sacrifices. So he wraps it up by saying, Though the sacrificial system seemed strange and foreign to us, it was part, of, uh, part and parcel of Israel's cultural environment. We should not be surprised that she was comfortable using animal sacrifices as a part of her worship of Yahweh. But we should also remember the striking differences between the way Israel and her neighbors practice sacrifices. All right, so any uh, thoughts, questions on that part? I think at this time. Well, when they were doing their sacrifices, the other uh, uh, religions, and when they were doing their sacrifices, did they get answers? I mean, they would make up answers, basically, you know. And then it could have gone as far as, uh, you know, satanic, you know, communication as well, whether that be possession or whatnot, and, you know, uh, you know predicting future, but then carrying it out through demonic, you know, in action. So, yeah, I'm sure they get answers in some cases, but... Again, they weren't the right answers they should have been getting. So, And again, nothing but de- uh, demonic uh, practice that they were entering into. All right, so the contents of Leviticus. So who were the Levites? Why was this book named for them? Again, another question. The Levites were descendants of Levi, Levi, one of the 12 sons of Jacob in Genesis 29, 34. Aaron and his family were chosen from this tribe to serve as priests and to offer the sacrifices. God appointed the rest of the Levites to the service of the tabernacle to assist the priests in the worship at the sanctuary. So again, remember, there was a tribe of Levi, and then out of the tribe you had Aaron and then his family. And Aaron and his family were the ones to be the priesthood, but all the the Levites were there to officiate over the temple and the tabernacle. And they were the ones that encamped, you know, pretty much directly right around it, as you know. Okay? So Aaron and his family were chosen from this tribe to serve as priests and to offer the sacrifices. God appointed the rest of the service of the tabernacle. And then as we see in Numbers uh, 3, uh, chapter 3, 5 through 10, uh, the priests assisted in the worship of the sanctuary. All right, the Septuagint is what I mentioned to you before. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was done much later, <clears throat> named the book for the Levites because portions of it deal with their instructions for offerings to God. These portions served as an instruction manual for the Old Testament period, a priesthood. But the Hebrew title for the book is taken from the first word, which is Wa Yakir. Yakir. And, and really what you have there in the first word, it's a compound word. Wa is the word and uh, if from the Greek. And then kara is the Greek word that means called ones. So these were the called out ones, uh, basically, or as it says, and he called, the called out ones. This is who this was addressed to. And remember, the Israelites were now what? The called out ones from Egypt and they, because they had gone on the Exodus. So they were the called out ones. And that's really what this book Leviticus is named in the Hebrew, the called out ones or and he called, as we would say, in the he being God himself. All right, which emphasizes that, uh, that Leviticus is a continuation of the Exodus storyline. The Israelites have a new covenant relationship with God, and now the Lord is sending Moses forth to the nation with instruction for proper worship, as we see in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Since the book was intended for the whole nation of Israel, as we see in verse 2, we should remember that it is still, uh, still functions as God's word for all who read it. All right, so I don't, uh, if you have your Bibles, let's go to uh, the book of Leviticus, if you're not there already. And we'll just look at these real quick in the Scriptures and 
may look at a few other verses a little bit later on too. But in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord called to Moses. Okay, So then he called. And again, God called out is what's in view here. Then he called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. And then it goes on into more instructions, which we won't get into at this point in time, uh, but uh, maybe a little bit later on. So again, we see that they're the called out ones, as God now is calling to Moses to give instructions for the priesthood and the worship inside the tabernacle. All right, so the last paragraph under that, it says, Whereas Exodus ended by emphasizing where to worship God, that being the tabernacle, Le- uh, Leviticus deals with how to worship him. After listening, the regula- after listing, sorry, after listing the regulations for the various types of sacrifices that may be offered to him, Leviticus deals with the priesthood in the topics of cleanness and holiness. Also, we could say uncleanliness as well. So it talks about the two, uh, cleanness and holiness in the book. So an outline that they give here is that it starts with the offerings, and that's uh, those five Levitical offerings in uh, chapters uh, 1 through 7. And again, just to give you that graphic I've shared with you in the past on the board, we have the five Levitical offerings. Again, we have the burnt offering, the meal offering, uh, the uh, peace offering, the sin offering, and then number five, the trespass offering. And those are all given in the first seven chapters and how they were to officiate over those. And so at the end of the chapter 7, uh, end of, well, at, uh, 6 all the way to, uh, through chapter 7, we also see the regulations uh, for the priests in regard to these offerings. Then the second major outline is that the, uh, in regard to the peace, priesthood. We see the consecration of the priesthood of the priests, the installation of them, and the consequences of disobedience. So if they, do, if they went bad, again, bad things would happen to them. Then we see the third major section, which is cleanness versus uncleanness. And then we see regulations, and then also speaking about the Day of Atonement. Again, one of the high holidays for Israel on the Day of Atonement, when they were ultimately to, or or through that uh, process and ceremony, it was the signification of just getting rid of all sin from the prior year. Again, they were to get rid of sin through confession throughout their year, but again, at the end of the year, it was like, you know, clean the house. Okay, let's just get rid of it all. It's all gone, and let's start fresh, and let's start new. That was why he gave them the Feast of the Atonement. Then we have uh, the fourth major section, the Holiness Code, and we see the sanctifying of blood and the importance of it. Uh, we see moral laws, again, how to live uh, daily, priestly regulations, w- the worship calendar, again, when each of the feasts and festivals would come. Uh, we see uh, the importance of the oil, the bread, and then any uh, blasphemy that uh, would come as a result of not doing things appropriately. We see the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee, which was that every 50th year. And then we see rewards and punishments, and then vows and tithes. So we see those at the end of the book. So by way of overview, the opening section of the book, of the book deals with right forms of worship inside the tabernacle and later the permanent temple. The five types of acceptable sacrifices found in chapters 1 through 7 and the conditions for representative priesthood in chapters 8 through 10 and for acceptable worshipers, which is in chapters 11 through 16. Then the rest of the book in chapters 17 through 27 are the so-called Holiness Code, is devoted to right living outside the tabernacle. So Leviticus is concerned with right worship and right living, with becoming holy and staying holy. The Bible consistently joins right worship inside the church to right living outside of it. Any worship worship that tolerates and continues to permit unrighteous behavior is not Christian worship. Worship. The first seven chapters serve as a manual of offerings for all Israelites. See the summary in chapter 7, and you may have a typo in your book. I had a typo in mine. It says verses 38 and 39. 
but it's, there's no 39. It should say 37 and 38, okay? My book had a typo there, all right? So, and then it goes on to say, these chapters describe five different sacrifices. The first three sacrifices, the burnt, cereal, and peace offering, and again, the cereal, we, all, we call that the meal offering, are the most common in the Old Testament. Again, that uh, meal offering also, uh, again, can be called a grain offering. Okay, they're the most common in the Old Testament, and each description of these offerings concludes with a variation of the expression, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. So in other words, he was pleased with their sacrifice. And you see the various verses there. These three sacrifices stress the result of the offering from God's perspective. And that's an interesting point, and I, you know, I would uh, venture to underline that or highlight that in your books and understand that, the, again, these three sacrifices stress the result of the offering from God's perspective. Okay? So again, this is God looking down and uh, what He is looking for man to do. All right. Then the next section... Presenting the two other sacrifices, which is sin and guilt offering, have a different arrangement and function. They are less concerned with the value of the animal presented and more with the types of sin committed, intentional or inadvertent, and the status of the sinner. Each section dealing with these two sacrifices is marked with variations of the expression, the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin, and he shall be forgiven. These two sacrifices then emphasize the result from the human perspective. Okay? So again, that's the important aspect of the last two, what we receive out of it, the forgiveness of our sins. Okay? Now, in your book... Um, uh, to the page uh, just left of that, again, you probably have the insert that says the types of sacrifices. If you have a, a, a breakout box, it talks about that. And again, uh, let's just go through all of those and uh, read uh, you know, uh, what they're saying about each one of them. So again, uh, it says there were many types of sacrifices in the Old Testament, numerous variations of the basic ones listed here. The list includes only the prescribed sacrifices of Leviticus 1 through 7. So we start with the burnt offering in Leviticus 1. It was a typical Hebrew offering, dominant throughout the Old Testament history, and probably the oldest form of atonement sacrifice. The term describes an offering of ascent or an offering that goes up. The animal was completely burned on the altar, its smoke rising towards heaven. Leviticus required... A male without blemish, various animals were allowed according to financial ability. So again, the smoke going up, again, talking about the pleasing aroma and the satisfactory of God's accepting of the sacrifice as well. All right, then number two is the cereal offering or the meal or grain offering. Uh, I've mentioned uh, three different ways in uh, various books and commentaries. And that's in Leviticus 2. It may originally have been a, pre, a, a present or gift, since the term simply means a gift. In Levitical regulations, the cereal offering carried an expiating sense. Again, payment for sin. Frequently accompanied burnt and peace offerings, probably served as a less expensive burnt offering for those who could not afford an animal. Okay? But again, the grain offering really as we know even better than what the book has said. It really talks about the body of Jesus Christ and the offering of His body as He is the bread uh, and the bread of life. All right, number three, the peace offering, Leviticus 3. The basic form of sacrifices brought on feast days, or it was, and uh, it, it, celeb it was celebrative, it was a celebrative, celebrative offering consumed by humans. So they could eat from this offering, as we know. Often paired with the burnt offering, which was consumed by God. Does not appear to have been ex ex expiatory, but had to do with restoration and reconciliation. It had three subtypes, and we've noted these before. There was a thanksgiving sacrifice, a vow or a votive sacrifice or offering, and then also a free will offering as well. 
And this was more of a voluntary uh, sacrifice. Again, if they wanted to give thanks to God or if they were happy that something happened within their life or God provided for them, this was the sacrifice that they would offer in thanksgiving unto the Lord. Or if they made a vow to God, this would be the sacrifice that they made to Him. And then free will is just at any time. If they just felt like doing it because, again, they enjoyed their relationship with the Lord, they would commit this sacrifice. All right, then we get to sin offering. And that's in Leviticus chapter 4 through chapter 5, verse 13. And remember, these are the manward uh, emphasis. And these are, oh, this one is expiatory for offenses against God. Emphasized the act of purification involves ceremonial defilement, deception, misappropriation, and seduction. It varied across four classes of individuals, whether it be priests, the congregation, a ruler, or an individual. Okay? And so they all had their own uh, commandments that were given to them in regard to a sin offering, and again, offense against God. Then number five is the guilt offering, and that's in Leviticus 5, 14 through 6, chapter 6, verse 7. It's a subcategory of the sin offering. It is expiatory but devoted to restitution and reparation. It generally deals with a profanation of sacred items and violations of social nature. So again, if you uh, lied in a court of law or something like that, again, this would be that type of offering that you would offer up. Okay? Or if you were to hurt somebody or do something against the law, this would be a, a sinful thing. Again, this would be the offering that you would offer in that case. All right, any questions on that? <clears throat> now you also probably have in your book, I have in my book this picture, I was able to find it on the internet. And again, showing the sacrifice uh, that was done at the brazen altar, and this is where they would bring any of the, the, uh, the animal offerings that they would have burned and a sacrifice unto the law, a Lord. And the priest would officiate over that. And then if necessary, based on the sacrifice, the priest would bring uh, blood and sprinkle it around uh, the altar. That's why you can see a little bit of red on the ground, a lot of blood on the ground there. They would go wash at the brazen laver and then if necessary, bring it into the holy place and the holy of holies, which is the curtain uh, tent building in the background. So again, uh, this is the sacrifice. And uh, you can kind of see over here, okay, this is where they would... uh, you know, kind of dress up the animal, as we would say. They'd sacrifice it and then, you know, take out the entrails and different things like that and the skin. And, you know, they had various regulations for each of the animal sacrifices that they would commit. And then there were certain portions that they would bring back uh, to the altar and then sacrifice them there or and offer them up to God there. Okay? So it gives a good uh, picture of what was going on. All right, so then when we look at chapter, back in the book, the next section in the paragraph, chapters 8 through 10, and these chapters describe the ordination and installation of the priesthood and demonstrate the consequences of improper priestly activity. We do not know the specifics about the unholy fire of Nabab and uh, Abihu, But the context emphasizes the holiness of Yahweh and the necessity of approaching Him only as He has prescribed. So let's go to chapter 10. Let me just show you that real quick. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 10. Now, well, I'll just read it because it gives you all the information I think you need uh, to put the picture together. It says, now Nadab and Abihu, or Abihu, uh, the sons of Aaron, again, they were sons of Aaron, they were priests, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord the Lord. Okay. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. 
Now, what's that all about? Well, these two guys, again, they were supposed to, it was prescribed to them what, where they were to get the fire coals from outside on the altar and then bring that into the inside altar of incense, okay? And they were to bring specific coals from the, the, uh, this fire outside with the sacrifices that had been committed. Plus, any incense that they would burn, God had given them the formula for that incense. And if there was any, so what these guys did was they took fire from another fireplace, or maybe there wasn't even an appropriate sacrifice when they had taken the fire coals, and they had took a different incense and just put it in the fire pan, okay, and offered that to the Lord. So what they did was to do a right thing in a wrong way. Okay, they brought fire, they brought incense, but it was the wrong fire and the wrong incense according to God's prescribed manner. All right, so that's what they brought in, and because of that, God killed them where they stood. And again, from the presence of the Lord, remember what the presence of the Lord was the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day? Well, as they came in, you know, we can imagine a lightning bolt came down and struck them, or fire came down and struck them and just not killed them both right where they stood. But we're also, I'm going to read a little bit more, we're also going to see that then there was instruction to get their bodies out of there, carry them out of there, and so their bodies were still intact and their clothing was still intact, but yet they were dead, okay? So whatever the fire or the lightning bolt that came down and killed them didn't consume them completely. So that is probably what occurred, but there is also some ancient law not L-A-W, but L-O-R-E, lore, okay, I should say, right? That's how you spell lore, right? Uh, Any English majors out there? All right, but uh, ancient lore, okay, or tale, is that they were drunk when they did this. And that might have been a situation as well because there's later instruction right after this is that no one, no priest is to be drunk when they offer their sacrifices to the Lord. Okay, and they uh, operate in their priestly service. So, again, that might have been what they did as well. And because of the sin that they were carrying within their body due to their drunkenness, again, they brought in strange fire and strange incense. Even though it might have been the right fire and the right incense, again, they did a right thing, but in a wrong way. They did it out of fellowship, and they did it in a sinful state. Okay? And therefore, God did not accept it. And again, they shamed the Lord. Okay? They shamed the Lord in the presence of God because they were functioning and operating in sin as they were operating in their priestly services. So ergo, make sure you rebound and recover before you do anything in the spiritual life. Okay? That's why it's very important that we confess our sins. Okay? And that's why it always irks me when people don't think you need to confess your sins. All right, verse 4. It says, Moses uh, called also to Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come forward, carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary to the to outside of the camp. So they came forward and carried them still in their tunics to, to the outside of the camp, as Moses had said. Then Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Eleazar and uh, Ithamar, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, so that you may not die, and that he may not become wrathful against all the congregation. But your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, shall bewail the the burning which the Lord has brought about. So again, they couldn't tear their, their, their tunics or shave their heads, which was a custom when someone would die, and, and, and representing the mourning that they would go through uh, and the uh, angst that they had in regard to the person dying, they couldn't do that. Because again, God did not want them to identify with these individuals, okay? Because they were sinful and they were disrespectful to the Lord, so they couldn't do that. But he did say, your family can moan, and I love what it's, uh, they can mourn. And what does it say? Bewail. It's kind of an interesting, you know, it's almost like not moaning for the loss of someone, but wailing because of the sinful act that they committed, okay? 
uh, in regard to the mourning of them as well. So very interesting. Uh, and uh, then it says in verse 7, You shall not even go out from the doorway of the tent of meeting, lest you die. For the Lord's atoning oil is upon you. So they did according to the word of Moses. And then here we see in verses 8 and 9, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, uh, uh, then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Now, let me just put this little plug in for my study from last night and Sunday. Remember we talked about God revealing Himself to us, and sometimes it's through direct communication. That's one way of God's revelation to man. Well, we see Him speaking directly to Aaron, so God's revealing Himself to Aaron and explaining to him something about himself. Now, so he gives him this instruction. Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, so that you may not die. It is a perpetual statue throughout your generations. And so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean, and so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. All right, so then it goes on and continues after that. But So again, you can see why the Lord would be that these individuals might have well as have been drunk when they performed these ceremonies and these sacrifices and operated in their priesthood. And as a result, God you know, uh, you know, uh, killed them where they stood okay? and dropped them right then and there uh, because of their uh, profanity towards the Lord in their uh, priestly uh, officiation. All right, so um, again, I think that gives us a good understanding of uh, what was going on there. All right, but then uh, so we see in chapters 8 through 10, again, the ordination. We see Nabad and Abihu. And then in uh, uh, the next paragraph in chapter 11 through 16, these have to do with the distinction between clean and unclean. They deal with practical, everyday issues in ancient life. Food in chapter 11, childbirth in chapter 12, skin and fungus diseases in 13 and 14, bodily discharges in chapter 15, the food restrictions of chapter 11 build on previous injunctions regarding the eating of meat. At creation, humans were intended to be vegetarians, Genesis 1, 29 through 30. But after the flood, God granted to Noah and his family the right to eat meat, as long as the blood was properly drained. In Genesis chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Leviticus 11 now expands the restrictions based on the distinctions between clean and unclean animals. We do not know in every case why eating certain foods or why certain physical activities caused uncleanness. Some foods were unclean because they carried diseases. In ancient societies where no refrigeration was possible in a hot climate, Meat posed a serious threat to public health. But there may have been many theological reasons for the ban on certain foods. And I'll take out the may have been to say there absolutely were, okay, in many cases, okay? There were theological reasons for these. Perhaps some were too closely associated with pagan worship practices as well. Others were prohibited because of the idea that blood and life are synonymous, in Leviticus 17.11. Israelites were required to show the highest respect for life as a gift from God, so that even edible animals must have their blood drained completely, chapter 17, verses 13-14. through 14. The people could only eat animals that fed on various kinds of grasses, making all uh, carnivorous, uh, carnivorous predators forbidden as part of the diet. Cloven, cloven and uncloven hoofs was another aspect of that as well, as uh, you'll read when you get into the book. Ultimately, we have to conclude that these chapters on the distinctions between clean and unclean are object lessons teaching a hidden reality. And again, we would say typology. Chapters 11 through 15 look forward to and prepare us for the Day of Atonement in chapter 16. They describe what is meant by uncleanness so that it may be absolved on the Day of Atonement, 
as we see in chapter 16, verse 16. Just as chapters 1 through 7 describe the sacrifices offered at the consecration of the priesthood, chapters 8 through 10, so chapters 11 through 15 define the uncleanness that makes the Day of Atonement necessary. All right, so let's get into the Day of Atonement a little bit. It was one of the most sacred days in the Old Testament calendar. Also in Leviticus 23, verses 26 through 32, where it is listed in uh, Israel's religious feasts or appointed times. Unlike many of Israel's other high holidays or holy days, it does not commemorate one of God's great and mighty acts of the past or celebrate His goodness at harvest time. On the Day of Atonement, God provided an annual time for purging all the sins and uncleanness that were unatoned for during the year. It provided atonement for the high priest, the sanctuary, and the people, so that all might be clean before the Lord. So again, another interesting aspect is that all the other you know, feasts represented something that uh, you know, was going on that God did, like the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Pentecost. They had to do with the harvest. And then even Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, that had to do with, again, the fall harvest. But atonement, again, didn't commemorate any significant thing or a harvest. But what it did was focus in on that one thing, sin, and the removal of sin and what God would do to remove sin for the people. All right, so it goes on to say, On this one day each year, the high priest was permitted to enter the Holy of Holies, the inner precinct of the tabernacle. And again, the, the diagram uh, that we've had, again, you see uh, kind of a, um, more of a schematic here, but the altar of burnt, uh, burnt offering, the laver, then you have the first room, the holy place, with its three articles, and then the Holy of Holies that had the Ark of the Covenant. And this is another good picture that's kind of a cutout that you would see inside there. And remember the great curtain that divided the two because, again, only once a year the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Okay? And uh, so therefore the, that great curtain divided the two, uh, the holy place from the Holy of Holies. Here's another uh, close-up. You see the articles inside, the table of showbreads representing the bread of life, Jesus Christ, the golden candlestick, Again, the, uh, the light of Jesus Christ, He is the light of the world. And then the altar of incense, which represented our prayers uh, that God is satisfied with. And then in the back room behind the curtain, ultimately is the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of it is what's called the mercy seat. Or uh, technically in the Bible, it's called the atonement seat. Mercy seat was something uh, named later on uh, in the mid, uh, uh, during the dark ages of our current uh, 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 current. Um, or of the past millennium. All right, so uh, again, you have the Ark of the Covenant, and then you have the mercy seat on top, and that's where the Shekinah glory dwelt, and that's where the high priest would go in. And prior to that, Moses also was able to go in from time to time and have communication uh, with God, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in, and he would uh, do his various priestly services of uh, incense and uh, sacrifices and also blood sprinkled, sprinkled around the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Back into the book. All right, so the diagram, uh, and it says, uh, talking about the high priest, it says, there he carried the blood of the slain offerings to make atonement for himself and the nation, verses 14 and 15. Again, this is, of, uh, this is all talking about uh, chapter 16. Okay, chapter 16, verses 14 and 15. It says, for the Christian, who is a new high priest, okay, oh, excuse me, for the Christian, I'll just say, a new high priest, that's Jesus Christ, has removed the need for the annual day of atonement. Christ entered the most holy place once for all to make atonement, not with the blood of animals, but with his own blood. And that's Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 12. All right, the blood of the slain offering was also part of the ceremony. Unique to this uh, uh, sacred occasion was the use of a scapegoat, the azeal. 
as we see in uh, verses 8 through 10 and then also 20 through 22. Let's go there because this, this is, a, you know, it's always, I think most of you understand the scapegoat analogy, but let's go to chapter 16 and let's just look at these passages real quick. So again, on the Day of Atonement, in verse 8 it says, And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. Again, for the Lord would mean that that one would be sacrificed. Then in verse 9, Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell, and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be uh, presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. In other words, that's kind of the, the sacrifices made over here, but then the goat going away was, uh, here's the removal of your sin. Okay, And that's what that goat signified, the removal, the taking away of your sin outside of the campment, outside of, uh, of the people. So again, uh, destroyed forever. Then jump down to verse 20. It says, when he finished atoning for the holy place in the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all the transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. I love that. Man who stands in the place of readiness, okay? And again, when we confess our sins and when we, you know, uh, uh, offer up our sins to the Lord in confession, again, we stand in readiness. We're ready, okay, we're ready, Lord. We're ready to get back into your plan. But even more importantly, the reason we can be ready is because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the man standing in readiness to take away our sins. And again, that's what that truly represents, Jesus Christ right there who took that took the sins of the scapegoat, and took it away from the people. Okay, A man who stands in readiness. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then in verse 22, And the goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. And then it goes on and talks more about uh, what Aaron would do uh, after that fact, which we won't get into at this point in time. But again, the scapegoat analogy, again, one goat sacrificed for sin, the other took our sins upon it, and then it was led astray. Took them away, never to be seen again. And that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So again, as I said, you know, what Jesus Christ did for us, you can't just see it in one thing. You know, you see Jesus Christ in the goat that was killed or sacrificed. You see Jesus Christ in the scapegoat that was led outside and took the sins away. And you see Jesus Christ in the man who was standing in readiness. So it took all of that to talk about this aspect of Jesus Christ taking away our sins. Okay? So again, one thing just won't do it, but all combined, it tells us of the work of our Lord. Okay, so where did we leave off? Uh, okay, so... Okay, the exact meaning of, and, and the pronunciation of this word is Azazel, so Azazel. So the, the exact meaning of Azazel, which was the word for scapegoat, is unclear. Some believe it referred to a specific evil location or to a desert demon. So verse 10 may be translated that it may be sent away into the wilderness of Azazel. Again, an evil place. But the Hebrew word, as understood by the ancient translations, probably referred to the goat itself and into the desert as a scapegoat. In either case, the function of the goat uh, in this part of the ceremony is clear. It physically symbolized the removal of the nation's sin. Aaron placed his hands on the head of the goat, confessed Israel's guilt, and then the, sent the goat into the desert. Significantly, the ideas of bearing, carrying iniquities into the desert, and forgiving are expressed by the same Hebrew verb, nasa. Okay, so the bearing, the carrying, and then also forgiveness, nasa, is that Hebrew word. Now, just to add a little bit to this uh, Azazel, that word, uh, some also, um, not only a demon, but others believed it was the name of Satan back in the ancient days as well. So, um, but probably just talking about the goat itself. 
All right, now to wrap this up, chapter 17 through 27, sometimes only chapters 18 through 27, are known as the Holiness Code. The reoccurrence of the term holy in this section signifies its unifying principle. This term with its derivatives occurs 85 times in these 11 chapters. The unit prescribes the way of holiness for all Israelites. It deals with topics ranging from sexual purity to observance of sacred holidays to fair treatment of the poor. This appeal for holy living is based on God's holy character. You shall be holy, for I the Lord am for, for I the Lord your God am holy. All right, so now we get into the themes of Leviticus, and there are three main themes that are going to be brought out here. So Leviticus establishes several basic themes for the rest of biblical thought. Bible authors assumed their readers understood certain concepts, such as sacrifice, atonement, forgiveness, and holiness. Leviticus gives the fundamental definitions for all of these. All right, let's get into the law now. So as we saw in the previous chapter, the book of Exodus clarified the concept of law as it functioned in the covenant relationship between God and the Israelites. Leviticus now outlines a large body of legal material. One verse near the end of the book ties all of Leviticus to the Sinai Covenant, which it says in quotes, These are the statutes and ordinances and laws that the law established between himself and the people of Israel on the Mount Sinai or on Mount Sinai through Moses. That's Leviticus 26, 46. So again, talking about bringing it all together. But the nature of the law in Leviticus is somewhat different from that of Exodus. Exodus outlined the Ten Commandments and explained how they applied to covenant life in ancient Israel. Leviticus is concerned with the laws for proper covenant worship and ritual cleansing. The question for the modern believer is, how do these laws of sacrificial rites and ritual cleansing relate to us? The same question may be asked of the caustic laws that we have in Exodus 21 through 23. Many Christians distinguish among moral, civil, and ceremonial law in the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments are the moral law. Specific laws of Old Testament society are civil laws, whereas laws dealing with sacrifices and ritual cleansing are ceremonial laws. Since Jesus affirmed the reestablish, excuse me, since Jesus reaffirmed and reestablished the Ten Commandments in Matthew chapter 5, the moral law is still applicable today. But many Christians sweep away the rest of the Pentateuchal law as outmoded because it is civil and ceremonial. Now, I'll just add to that in the Ten Commandments, the only thing, well, in God and in, in Jesus Christ in speaking to the Israelites, at that time, remember, they were still under the law. He might have talked about the Sabbath day, okay? But other than that, the rest of the Ten Commandments are mentioned in the New Testament, especially in the epistles. The only one of the Ten Commandments that's not mentioned in the epistles is to keep the Sabbath day. And again, that would be Saturday and a Saturday worship of God, whereas the church has moved it now to Sunday, and we worship on Sunday, and that now is our what we call a Sabbath day, we could say. And the reason for that is is because it was this, that day, the first day of the week, which is Sunday, that Jesus was resurrected. And we see throughout the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, a number of times where it talks about them meeting on the first day of the week and giving their offerings on the first day of the week. And even in the Greek, and some people have gone back and said, oh, in the Greek it says Sabbath. Well, it says Sabbath, Sabbath, okay? When it doubles up on Sabbath, Sabbath, it means the first day of the week, not the last day of the week. And again, so we see that being Sunday, and that's why we worship on Sunday rather than on the Saturday. Nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to meet on Saturday, but we do see them practicing meeting on the first day of the week, and our Lord was resurrected on the first day of the week. All right, just to clarify that for you. 
All right, I'm going to give you some more about the law and uh, some points and principles, but let's continue on. Um, and did I get to the paragraph? Uh, let's see. But this, this division into moral, civil, and ceremonial law? Okay. All right, so let's start there. But this division into moral, civil, and ceremonial law was unknown in Jesus' day. Some laws are both moral and civil, such as those against adultery, stealing, bearing false witness, and the like. Others are both moral and ceremonial, such as laws against idolatry and Sabbath breaking. All these laws contain a moral dimension, making the lines between the categories somewhat arbitrary. Furthermore, this approach to Old Testament law leads some Christians to take too lightly Paul's injunction that all Scripture is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Instead of the moral, civil, and ceremonial distinctions, it is better to accept some laws of the Old Testament as broad and generally intended for all societies. Others are specific applications to Israelite culture and society that cannot be applied in the same way today to our Western society and culture. On the other hand, much of the world today is closer to ancient Israel than we may think. For the majority of the world's population, the specific applications of civil law are not so far removed from ancient Israel. Old Testament law continues to be God's word for us, though we may apply it variously in different contexts. The moral substance of all of His commands continues to speak to the church today. Jesus summed up the law as love for God and love for all humanity. In Matthew 22, 36-30, If we ask, Yes, but how does this or that law apply to me? The Bible invites us to examine ancient Israel as the model and example. As we compare our situation to theirs, we accept Old Testament law as confirmed by Christ and within the help of His Holy Spirit, the lessons learned from church history. The specifics of how we ought to love God and neighbor should become clear. So, I think they're a little bit soft okay, in what they're saying there compared to what we understand and know the Word of God to be. But as you know, we are no longer under the law, period. Okay? But the Lord gives us a lot of good example about how to live life. Live life in a government, in a society, laws that uh, we, we should not break. And it also tells us about how to live morally as well. Much of that law in regard to a civil life and a moral life is repeated in the New Testament. So yes, we are to live those things. But the ceremonial law that is found and the sacrifices that were uh, 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 ordered for Israel to abide by ultimately are absolutely nullified within our day and age and in this church age in which we live in. So again, some of these things of the law are good for us to live a moralistic life, but it's not the, the life, it's not our, it does not give us salvation, and it is not the means of the spiritual life. Okay? But they do tell you how to live morally and how to live within a peaceful, loving society. And that's why we adopt them and uh, bring them into our lives. And the United States of America, in our civil law, it's mostly and primarily based on the Jewish law, the law of Israel for the society. So again, uh, we see some importance there. But let me give you some more in regard to the law. So as the divine policy for client nation Israel, the Mosaic Covenant was divided into basically three parts, which we call three codices, okay? Codex 1, 2, and 3. So this is for client nation Israel and the people of Israel. Codex 1, as we call it, ultimately is the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, which it's also known as, and it's called the Moral Laws, and that's in Exodus chapter 20, and uh, verses uh, 1 through 17, and then explained thereafter in the book of Exodus. All right, so basically, what was the reason for these laws, the Ten Commandments? Basically, it was also the Freedom Code, which defines freedom in terms of morality, privacy, property, and also authority. 
authority of God, authority of parents over children, things like that. Okay? So again, this is the freedom code. If you live by these things, you're going to have freedom because you're going to respect uh, you know, uh, uh, authority, morality, and privacy and profit property in the lives of other people and in your own life as well. All right, then we have codex number two. And these are what can be called the ordinances, the spiritual code, or also the ceremonial laws. And these are also found in the book of Exodus in chapter 25, verses, uh, verse 1, all the way to chapter 31, verse 18. And then we have them also here in the book of Leviticus, as you know. And what are these all about? Well, basically, this is the ritual plan of God for Israel. These are the rituals that they were to keep. The spiritual heritage includes a complete Christology and soteriology. In other words, it told them about Christ, told them about salvation and how to deal with sin. Again, taught through the rituals and then also the oral communication that was given to them uh, as, uh, as well. And again, they were given instruction as to the furniture and the various articles within the tabernacle, the structure of it itself, the temple, uh, all the delineations of the holy days, how they should be functioning and operating uh, inside the Levitical priesthood. That's in the book of Leviticus as we have here. Again, the function of these Levitical offerings are found here. And basically, this was the heritage for the people of Israel so that they could understand the coming of their Messiah, the God of Israel, Emmanuel, the Messiah, the Chosen One, also called the Shekinah Glory. So that's what Codex number 2 was all about, to point to the person and work of Christ. Then Codex number 3 is called the Judgments, or the Establishment Code, again, Divine Establishment Principles for Nations, and then also the Civil Laws. In Exodus 21, 1 through 23, uh, nine speak to those things as well, as does the ba back half of the book of Leviticus. So what is this? Well, this is a compilation of the laws of divine establishment or a code for civilization. And these are for believers and unbelievers. Okay? This isn't just for the believers, but for all people and how to live cohesively within a society. And so again, this was given to the people of Israel so that they could uh, live in a peaceful society uh, with each other. And this is the way that the client nation Israel was to conduct itself and to live. And the regulations that are found within this book, again, what do they emphasize? They emphasize holiness of God, the holiness that can be found within the people, and as well as of operating in the holiness of the spiritual life. So that's what this law was given to the people of Israel for, so that they could understand how to live holy and righteous unto the Lord, and ultimately how to worship Him properly and cor correctly in their day, as it was also, as we see in the book of Galatians, a tutor for the person of Christ. Again, it told them of who and what Christ is and what He would do for them upon the cross. All right, so that gives us... a. Uh, quick overview of what the law was all about. All right, let's get into the book uh, again and look at the last two sections of the book of Leviticus and the, the last two main themes. The second theme is sacrifice. Leviticus is the primary source of the Old Testament for regulations on sacrifice and how properly to offer sacrifices to God. Yet the book seldom states explicitly what the theology behind such sacrifices is. In chapter 17, verse 11, is one of the exceptions. In general, the first three sacrifices, the burnt, cereal, and peace offerings, could be presented as the worshippers desired. The last two, the sin and the guilt offerings, were used to provide expiation from sin. Expiation is the purging of impurity caused by sin. It resulted in the removal of guilt the granting of forgiveness, and the restoration of the relationship between the sinner and God. For several of the blood offerings, the worshiper placed his hand on the head of the sacrificial animal. You see scriptures for that. This action identified the animal with its substitute. This does not necessarily mean the worshiper's guilt was transferred to the animal, but the animal suffered the consequences of the worshiper's sin. And again, as you know, this was all type of transfer of our sins to Jesus Christ. God ordained sacrificial blood as the means for cleansing sin. 
I have given blood to you for making atonement for the lives, uh, excuse me, for your lives on the altar. Every form of life is precious, is a pre- precious gift from God. Here God established the spiritual principle that life itself, not some lesser gift, must be returned to him for the purpose of atoning for sin. The exact meaning of the Hebrew word atonement, which is kippur, and it should be, a, I'm not sure if your parentheses has an er at the end, but it should be a ur, is uncertain, but it somehow means the animal sacrifice ransomed the sinner from the death which the sinner deserved. The animal became the worshiper's substitute and lost its life in order for the sinner to live. The New Testament asserts that the death of Jesus Christ is now the sacrifice that makes atonement for sin. That's Hebrews 9, 26, 1 John 2, verses 1 through 2. His sacrifice was not limited to a single worshiper or nation, but is offered to the world as a means of forgiveness. It need never be repeated, for His sacrifice is sufficient for all who respond in faith. Christ's death on the cross has thus replaced the Levitical system of sacrifices, but just as in the old system, God still invites us individually to respond in repentance and faith so that Christ may become a substitute for us, redeeming us from our sin and guilt. All right, so again, that's the second major theme of sacrifices. Then now we see the fourth, excuse me, the third, which is holiness. And so holiness, the key note of Leviticus, is its resounding, Be holy, for I am the Lord. That's chapter 11, 19, and 20. God's call for Israel to live a holy life is based on His own holy character. He has not asked His people to become uh, something He is not. The difference between His holiness and Israel's holiness is that His is intrinsic, while theirs is derived from their relationship with Him. And remember, intrinsic means that's who He is. God is holy. We learn how to be holy, but as you know, uh, at salvation, we have received the holiness of God or the righteousness of God in our human spirit, but the rest of our body has sin nature in it. So in, with that, we need to learn how to be holy based on our relationship with Him. All right, the last, next paragraph. So it is with Christians today. God summons us to live a holy lifestyle. But our holiness is derived from Him as we live in fellowship with Him and learn to obey His will with the help of His Holy Spirit. Through the ancient message of Leviticus, God invites us to share in His holy character. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Chapter 19, verse 2. This message is not time-conditioned. Since the Apostle Peter made it the cornerstone of his first epistle, as we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. This is indeed humankind's highest calling to imitate God. So the book of Leviticus is indispensable for understanding the warp and the woof of ancient Israelite society and culture. Does anybody know what warp and woof means? Warp and woof? I had to look it up, so I did. So it's, an, it's a term that came around the 1500s, and uh, warp means uh, lengthwise, and woof means crosswise, and it had to do uh, with making textiles or weaving something together, okay? And you need the warp and the woof in order to make clothes or to make a blanket or something like that. And so basically, warp and woof is a phrase for the essential foundation or base of any structure or organization. And a good example of that is like the United States of America, the basis for our organization in construction is our Declaration of Independence along with our Constitution. And that would be our warp and our woof, okay, as a nation. So the book of Leviticus, as he is saying, is their warp and their woof for, again, establishing the people and the society as a nation. Again, the society and the culture. All right, going on, it says, Furthermore, the New Testament epistle to the Hebrews, 
expounds the importance of Leviticus for Christians today. It clarifies the meaning of the sacrifice and priesthood of Jesus Christ. As God's word for believers in today's world, Leviticus still speaks to us about reverence in worship, purity in lifestyle, and our need for forgiveness. All right, so that completes the textbook for this evening. And then you can go back and... um, Uh, Look at the the breakout boxes for summary and then also uh, questions and uh, review them on your own as well. And uh, try to answer, especially in the study questions, that's your quiz. Uh, So I know I don't give quizzes this time around, but uh, that's your quiz uh, if you so choose to take it. So again, see if you can answer those questions. All right, so uh, anything else? Any other questions or comments or thoughts? All right, so that's the book of Leviticus giving us uh, uh, really the ceremonial law and then also the civil law for the people of Israel. Uh, Next week, we're going to get into the book of Numbers, and uh, we'll get back into, again, it starts off, as you know, as we've already uh, noted today, starts off with the law again, repeating many of the things, reemphasizing them, and then we get into the history of Israel wandering in the wilderness and the various uh, things that went on during that time. So we'll see that in the book of Numbers. Okay, we'll do that next week. All right, so uh, we'll close in prayer right now. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this time of praise and worship and helping us to understand your uh, book even better, your instruction and manual for uh, Israelites and also uh, typology for us in the spiritual life in the church age. We thank you for helping us to learn and understand these things and help us to delve into your word deeper and deeper each and every day, Father, so that we delve into our relationship with you more and more and deeper and deeper. So, Father, we ask that you give us travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen.